Welcome to the 1Q FY22 earnings conference call of CAMS uh, to, uh, to discuss the financial performance and business updates. We have with us uh, this, mo this morning, Mr. Anuj Kumar, Managing Director, and Mr. Ramcharan SR, Chief Financial Officer. I will now like to hand over the call to Anuj for his opening comments. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Nishal. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, earnings call, the 1Q earnings call of CAMS. And uh, I have here myself, uh, Ram Charan, who's a CFO, and, and she's an investment services officer. Uh, we've had a satisfactory quarter. You would have seen the results by now. And uh, overall, in our core business, in the mutual funds market, uh, all operating metrics uh, seem to have shaped up well in the months of April, May, and June. Although there was an overhang of the second wave of the pandemic, which manifested itself in uh, some contraction in transaction volumes, especially the chargeable paper transactions, and uh, a lot of contraction, in, uh, especially in the month of April, April and May, in uh, sales and investor interaction activity. I think overall, uh, it was a pretty strong quarter. And what I'll do is, uh, I'll take you through this uh, presentation. I'll continue calling out the charts, just so that you're able to follow uh, the flow. So as you can see from a, from a business continuity perspective, uh, given that the second wave of COVID hit us in April and has pretty much lasted uh, all through the first quarter, we were able to manage uh, you know, the entire rhythm of expanding, working from home, uh, a second round of shutting of uh, some of our front offices. And this time we were a lot more select, but we had to shut those locations which were uh, where the government authorities asked us to shut, or the offices were in containment zones, or our employees' uh, strength was afflicted and therefore we could not open. So it wasn't as bad as one few last year but it was very severe, uh, just taking the intensity uh, of the second wave. Uh, overall, in 1Q, our transaction volumes touched a historic high. So this is the highest number that we've seen ever, of about 87.5 million, out of which over 16 million is uh, investor and distributor initiated transactions, a lot of the others, uh, pre-scheduled, pre-ordered kind of transactions like SIPs. Uh, Edge 360, which is a distributor uh, utility, uh, we had launched the app in March of 2021. Uh, so it had about 10,000 downloads in the Play Store and registered distributors, the ones who participate, uh, touch 40,000. Uh, the account aggregator business, uh, which is still not officially launched, but which is going through uh, almost like a beta phase, is gaining traction. We have 18 FIUs. Those are users who will solicit information for investors and users, basis of consent coming from the investor, and then four uh, information providers who officially signed up with us. CAMS Pay, which is our payment aggregator services, uh, continued to expand both the product suite and uh, transactions. And transaction volumes for the first time ever crossed 10 million every month. So that was a nice milestone. You're aware that we've been working on the Franklin Templeton transition where uh, we did the contract signing in July of last year. So we've gone live in the month of July, which was outside the quarter, uh, but still is worthwhile mentioning it here. Uh, this was the first instance of significant rebadging of staff that we did in camps. And the operations have gone live in Chennai and Hyderabad, and the operations continue to stabilize. Uh, we had launched other based um, EKYC based on OTP. Uh, this, you know, was launched sometime in the previous quarter, has now got integrated with multiple digital platforms, mostly of the asset managers and is helping in a significant way to seamless onboarding of mutual fund customers. MyCamps as a individual household kind of mutual fund uh, uh, app and utility had crossed 4 million unique investors, touch 4.2, so we saw 
as investors were slightly constrained in terms of uh, either meeting their advisors or doing anything in the physical world, continued to flock towards digital platforms. My council was also benefited. And then we saw peak logins, which is instances of individual investors coming in, logging in once or many times in a day across two and a half lakh. A CRA business, which was uh, officially announced in March and then subsequent license, uh, we continue to work on the product development and progressing well for an end of, uh, end of December kind of a launch. And then as part of the ease of doing business committee of SEBI, uh, you may have read, a lot of you have read, that uh, a unified platform is now in the, uh, in the design and build phase and will be launched shortly, which will create uh, a unique utility giving uh, the benefit of uh, unified processes across several AMCs or across the entire spectrum of AMCs. And therefore, for an investor to get serviced uh, in various formats on a single platform across a set of mutual fund holdings will become much easier. And this will result in significant ease for the investor reduction in any operating pain or delays that he goes through and will elevate the pitch for the entire industry. So those are the key uh, business highlights uh, for the quarter. Chart number seven, I'll cover the Franklin Go Live uh, in brief. Uh, as I said, a very large people migration and the largest, single largest migration ever in the mutual fund industry which was completed uh, in this entire COVID phase. The LOI came to us on 13, 14th March last year, just prior to COVID. And then we concluded this whole thing uh, at the end of AF2, uh, went live on 19th of July. So through the onerous challenging circumstances, we were able to get this entire thing together. Uh, the Franklin teams were to be rebadged or brought over in Chennai and Hyderabad. So we set up, although we were present in Hyderabad through our own front office, the branch, but we did not have processing staff, which has now commenced, so we've set up an office there. And just managing significant complexities in terms of processes, design of platforms, uh, practices, systems, data interchange, APIs. There was just a lot of work to be done on all those fronts, and this is despite the fact that we operate, uh, you know, the, the, the RTA work, the, the liability work, operations, scope for almost 70% of the industry, we did see that there were some things to be smoothened out as we went live with Franklin. So all of that happened, and I'm very happy to share with you that that's uh, one more very significant addition to the client suite that we built very assiduously over the years. One please. Uh, just in terms of uh, key metrics and uh, key data, all of you track the industry, so you know a lot of this. I will not go too deep into all of this, but um, industry AUM, which is the average assets for one Q at over 33 lakh crore, 33 trillion. CAM service funds, this does not include uh, Franklin yet because all of that happened in July. This is uh, April, May, June averages at 23.1 trillion. And then you can see uh, significant growth, whether it's in overall asset growth for the industry and for the equity segment. And then overall growth for CAM service funds, or as we call it, CAMS industry. Uh, overall growth of assets at over 32% uh, year on year, and about 3.5% uh, in over the trailing quarter, which is 4Q of last year. And similarly, expansion of equity assets, very significant deep expansion of almost 46% over last year, and 6.5% in terms of uh, sequential quarters, which is 4Q of last year. All of this resulting into an AUM market share of just under 70%, 69.6, which will be slightly augmented now, and we will report new figures at the end of this quarter uh, after the Franklin uh, addition to the overall suite. Uh, go back. Uh, net equity inflows, which you know were a bit of a concern in the year 2021, remained positive in 1Q. Uh, SIP inflows grew, uh, which is a good sign. SIP, by the way, represented a very stable book through every bit of vagary that hit us in 2021, uh, but the, the inflow growth is very hard. 
and then uh, growth in total AUM, as you know, was driven both by equity and debt. Debt also has been at a very even clip, marked by significant deepening of sales uh, in the last month period. Uh, in terms of operational metrics, again, I think everything went north. I spoke to you about overall transaction volumes, historic high. We'd never done these volumes earlier, uh, so about 87 and a half million. 2% uh, quarter on quarter expansion, 15% year on year, and you will remember that 4Q of last year was also very deep and significant because the markets were returning to normal, uh, including redemptions where HMIs and other categories did book some profits. I think that itself had represented a transaction high, and 1Q was a further growth over that. Uh, the SIP book at just short of 230 lakh, about 29 million. Uh, again, 15% up year on year, very hard to think, and 7% quarter on quarter is, I think, is just a very good metric because you you know that that represents a very stable uh, monthly installment being part of the franchise, which has chosen to take a long-term view in the industry, and are here to save and invest with the industry for many years. Uh, systematic transactions process, this is largely triggers that we do, 10% up year on year, 5% quarter on quarter. A lot of the new SIP book that you see 15% year on year will, will start getting triggered. It depends upon when they came in. So the, the transaction growth isn't as fast as the registration growth that will catch up in 2 3 And then live investor folios uh, expanded to 41.6 million, 5% up year on year, 3% quarter on quarter. Uh, unique investor service last quarter, I think we reported something like 16.7 million, so almost 17. Again, 6% uh, up year on year, 2% quarter on quarter. So all of that, I think, is after five quarters, uh, just a good sign to see uh, uh, significantly deeper uh, selling activity and customer engagement activity happening in the industry, including in our part of the industry. I will now uh, request Ram Charan to take over from here and go through some of the key financial numbers. So uh, I will just take you through the broad financial highlights for the quarter. Um, revenue was at 201.17 crores, which was up 35.4% year on year and uh, little less than 1% quarter on quarter. The revenue growth was uh, driven by a growth in the MF business. Uh, MF business, uh, the asset, as you know, the MF business is actually has two components. One is the AUM based or asset based revenue and second is the non-asset based revenue. The asset based revenue uh, grew at 32.7% year on year, tracking the growth in the AUM. So the asset based revenue was at 155 crores and 2.3% and quarter on quarter. The non-asset based revenue, which uh, primarily consists of the transaction revenue, uh, some application revenue, call center revenue, and the out-of-pocket expenses reimbursement, that was up 60.5% year on year, and uh, it was down 8.5% quarter on quarter. Uh, if you recollect, the uh, the first quarter of last year was uh, when there was a COVID-related uh, uh, lockdown, and hence the transaction was actually came to a grinding halt. So the non-asset-based revenue growth year on year is a reflection of the increase in transaction when compared to the earlier quarter. And uh, overall, there has been an increase in the, the call center and the application revenue. And in terms of the non-MF revenue, uh, there has been a growth of 29% year on year. And uh, quarter on quarter, the growth is 1.4%. The non-MF revenue, as you know, will consist of our AAF business, uh, the, the payments business, the insurance business, and uh, some amount of uh, sterling uh, revenue, that is our in-house uh, software development. We do work for some mutual funds on software development. So that was up 29% year on year and 1.4% uh, quarter on quarter. Uh, just to bear in mind that uh, we uh, voluntarily deselected the banking and MBFC outsourcing business uh, in, uh, in, the, in the course of the last year. So that is kind of not part of these numbers. In terms of uh, the mix, uh, we were seeing in the course of the year a favorable movement in the equity component. Uh, equity, as you will know, is the highest yielding asset in our mix. And this equity component went up 3% year-on-year and 1% quarter-on-quarter. 
and uh, because of this although there was a depletion in the yield because of the price uh, because of a telescopic pricing structure you will recollect that the increase in the aum is generally accompanied by a decrease in our in our fees and yield because of the telescopic price with our, with our customers so uh, so this mix actually ended up mitigating some of that impact and hence uh, there was uh, when compared to year on year the yield was a little uh, was a little depleted but compared to quarter on quarter it was almost the same uh, in terms of the revenue growth uh, if you see uh, the growth uh, quarter on quarter was a little muted uh, because of two factors one was uh, there was this price uh, uh, related telescopic pricing related depletion yield that we generally get uh, historically, if you have uh, noted our story, uh, there is a, always a lag between the pace of growth of AUM and the pace of growth of our fees. Um, it is a combination of various factors, including the pricing discount that kicks in because of certain levels being reached, as well as the mix impact. And traditionally, it's been around 70% of the increase in AUM. So uh, in terms of the revenue for the la sequential increase in the revenue, uh, there was a depletion because of this factor, which is the asset growth, uh, fee growth was around 70% of the growth in AEM. And more importantly, uh, you know, because of the lockdowns that were on and off uh, localized in the last quarter, uh, the transaction revenue, the paper transaction revenue, uh, to be very precise, took a hit. And uh, that's the reason why the growth in revenue is a little muted quarter on quarter, although the asset based growth, the fee, the track, the usual trend in terms of increase when compared to the AEM growth. Uh, in terms of the profitability, uh, the PBT, uh, the operating EBITDA for the quarter was at 87.12 crores or 43.3%. Uh, this is a non India uh, in 116 based calculation of EBITDA is 43.3%. Uh, this was when compared to 44.9 crores uh, for the Q1 of FI21. That's a that's a growth of uh, uh, you know uh, substantial growth over the last quarter. And uh, the sequential EBITDA was 83.56 percent. In terms of PBT, uh, the quarter ended at 85 crores of PBT, which was up 64 percent year on year. Uh, the comparable PBT for uh, Q1 uh, uh, Q1 of uh, 2021 was 52 crores and was up 5% quarter on quarter. Uh, the comparable PBT for last quarter sequentially was 81 crores. In terms of PAT, uh, we entered the quarter at 63.24 crores, which was again up 59% year on year and 5% quarter on quarter. Uh, the comparable numbers for first quarter of 21 was almost 40 crores and the Q4 of 21 was 60 crores. Uh, the return on network uh, continues to be healthy at 43.3%. Uh, uh, you will also have uh, read that the, uh, that the board uh, actually recommended a dividend, first interim dividend of 6.5 rupees a share in its board meeting yesterday. Uh, if you look at the margin profile as such, you know, we have been uh, clocking a margin of around 40% over the last few quarters. Uh, and there's been a moderate increase in the current year, uh, current quarter. This is also attributable to uh, the reduced revenue from low margin business. Uh, as I indicated earlier, the transaction revenue, which is uh, not very accurate from a profit perspective, uh, came down uh, drastically in the last quarter, the paper-based transaction revenue that we gently approved to our books. And uh, so that kind of had an impact of increasing the margins a little. Overall, it has been a very satisfactory quarter from a margins perspective, EBT, operating EBITDA and PAT growing healthy when compared to the last year. We also ended the quarter with a healthy cash and cash equivalent of uh, rupees 393 crores. This amount 393 crores excludes the cash that we hold in trust, uh, which is most of an escrow account for a TCS or a stand duty. So this, in summary, was the financials for the period. There is also, in the earnings presentation, uh, a trend chart given for the way our revenue has moved over the last five quarters, the way our operating EBITDA has moved and PAT has moved and PBT has moved. And you would note that all of that shows the increasing trend. With this, I kind of uh, conclude the presentation regarding the financials. There are detailed financials in the presentation and uh, for you to have a look at and ask any questions. I leave the floor now open for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, 
may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants to ask a question, you may press star and one now. The first question is from the line of Parth Agarwal from Ladder of Wealth Management. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So I have a question regarding business model of CAM, uh, CAM Spencer. So how do you basically uh, make money in this business? Do you charge to financial information users or how is it done? Yeah, sure. So uh, the way the business is <coughs> designed, uh, the users will end up paying for these services that they are wearing. And it is typically, I'm not saying always, but it's typically a per statement download uh, kind of charging. The market is still uh, kind of getting used to what will be the best charging model, but this is the way it is architected right now. It's also predicated on the fact that uh, there will be no charges coming in to us from the providers. And the financial information users will pay the account aggregator or camp sensor on a per download basis. Uh, okay. And so what is the value proposition for the customers who are actually giving access to all that data? Means other than consolidating all my holdings and financials and everything, uh, is there any other value proposition for the customer? So that, that's a big value proposition. That's a big value proposition. From a pure information aggregation perspective, I as a user, uh, manage all my assets separately, store them, manage the passwords, etc., and then do the consolidation myself. I don't have a single view. So as a user, I get a single view for a small charge that I pay. And then in terms of uh, other usages, largely from a credit perspective, where a lender uses this information, A, to create a credit uh, decision and a credit framework up front, and then he or she can monitor it if I am borrowing the money. Uh, month on month by drawing that financial information once they have that concept. In any other format, today when I seek a loan, I give all that financial information and after that, the lender is virtually blind to how things are changing in my life. All of that can go away with the use of this utility. Right, okay. And just regarding CAMS pay, so do you take as a, for generating the revenue, do you take percentage of the transaction value or is it some flat fee model? So uh, CAMS pay works on two, two remedy models. One is, as you know, there is a, a registration of the mandate that happens for which there is a charge. And then there is a per transaction billing also that happens depending on the transactions that are put through the platform. And the per uh, transaction billing is a flat fee or percentage of value? It's a per transaction fee. Transaction fee, okay. Okay, that's all from my side. Uh, just a final question, sorry, sorry. Uh, this are uh, 23 lakh, uh, 23 trillion includes Franklin 60 to 70,000 crore, right? Whatever you have disclosed in your presentation? No, not yet, not yet. These are one Q numbers. As I okay. said, Franklin operations commenced in July. It does not include Franklin. Okay, okay. So it will be included from quarter two. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, okay. Thank you from my side and best of luck for the future quarters. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Siddharth Gupta from Voyager Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, sir, and congratulations on a set, again, posting a great set of numbers, sir. So my question is uh, with regard to the fact that uh, you spoke about uh, the revenue mix increasing from uh, non-mutual fund services. But uh, my key question is what kind of growth is expected from this sector again? Because uh, again, as a stakeholder, I see that the markets have already priced in an uh, almost an unimaginable uh, value of value growth of the share price. 
in the near future while we are continuing to grow at a stable rate which is great but that is for a mutual fund business why do we see our non mutual fund businesses grow in the near future thank you so on the non mutual fund side you know that uh, the primary contributors of profit have been camps pay and the uh, pms business uh, insurance has been a contributor largely to revenue not so much to profit and for the future uh, we find that uh, cra will certainly be a very exciting opportunity although uh, we are about 6 months away from launch uh, but very working very closely with the nps authority is to design the entire product and do a roll out and we are assembling the team and then account aggregator although the offtake in the market uh, has been slow it's a brand new model and therefore will go through a curve of uh, you know acceptance across all parts of the audience so those are really the 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 components which will uh, kick in uh, cra overall the marketplace uh, today our estimate although there are no uh, published industry numbers is just short of about 200 crores of industry revenue so at some point in time we become eligible to participate in that uh, some of that participation will need uh, displacement of uh, incumbents and some of that will be just new markets that we get into and account aggregator there are various estimates that you've been reading in the press and in various uh, industry reports so th- th- that's really how it is uh, our endeavor is to push that metric significantly in the coming years uh, from the 10% that we are at right now and uh, i don't want to uh, strictly start linking it in terms of how analysts are getting to the valuation that of course is their business and they will continue doing that but i can give you uh, the details from a business point of view thank you sir thank you so much thank you the next question is from the line of prayesh jain from motila lothal financial services please go ahead uh, yeah good morning sir from aviation and good set of numbers a uh, couple of questions firstly on the nf business when do we come for, you know when do the renegotiations come in uh, with uh, with the uh, mutual fund and what, how do you see the eagles moving uh, per se not just because of the telescopic pricing but also with respect to the renegotiations uh, that would ha- that would happen with the amt and uh, secondly on the account aggregator business you also mentioned that uh, the customers will also be uh, char- will also have to pay a charge Uh, for a small uh, a small charge for a, a single view so is that right understanding that you will have two uh, revenue models one will be from the uh, somebody like information uh, information user and the other is also the customer who is providing information or is allowing access to the information and thirdly on the ft thing with the kind of uh, legal tussle uh, it has been uh, do you see any Uh, incremental cost coming for you uh, with regards to the to the legal issues that are happening right now that would be my question sorry to interrupt uh, mr jain so there is a disturbance coming from your line request you to mute your line while the management answers your question okay uh, okay uh, prash i'll just uh, take the first question on the mf pricing and then i will uh, uh, request anish to take the second one so on the mf pricing uh, you know this is a general bilateral agreement as you know that we have with customers so the due date uh, actually falls at different dates it's not on a particular year everything comes uh, for renegotiation so it's a uh, it's kind of a depending on the contract expiry so it's a normal year and we expect that the expiry happens uh, you know at the end of two or three years of every customer generally so that happens there's nothing extraordinary that we expect from a discount perspective which will impact the yields unfavorably than what it has in the past in terms of our expectation of yield uh, while well, uh, we, we will be difficult to predict the future but uh, the past trends uh, has consistently been uh, that you know after considering uh, you know some price reduction mix impact and uh, the the impact because of the telescopic pricing we always uh, we have seen over the last few year for the last 5 and 10 years that our growth in fees has been around 70% of the growth in aum that's after considering the various uh, factors that interplay including the mix the re- negotiations as well as the telescopic impact on the on the second question on a i'll probably request anuj to chip in yeah, sure thanks ram so on the a just think of it as uh, 
the user paying the fee it's a it's a single payment model the user could be an individual when we seeking all this information for personal record keeping the user could be an nbfc or a bank when they're trying to lend to an individual but either way it is that user that single entity that will end up paying the charges uh, more than that there are no other uh, revenue streams visible as of now so that's point number one point number two on franklin uh, i think uh, whatever uh, whatever the wind down schemes and other related matters uh, need in terms of handling. That is something that Franklin is doing themselves and that continues to remain uh, completely their remit and their scope. Of course, the operating part will come to us, which means uh, some of the payment of monies, etc., which is happening, as you know, through SBI Mutual Fund. Uh, all that operating part, uh, we will have to step in from time to time. But other than that, every other part of handling the market facing part of the wind down schemes, et cetera, is completely the scope of Franklin. And they continue to uh, stay in charge and manage it independently themselves. Whenever they need any help on the operational side, they will come to us and we will, we will extend all the help. But there is no change in terms of how all of that will get executed. Uh, okay, uh, just a follow up on the account aggregator, uh, account aggregator. How different is it going to be from the Sybil score in the sense that Sybil score also provides a lot of information to lenders? Uh, which, uh, so, how different is it going to be from the Sybil score? Because any other asset classes that are going to be merged with account aggregator that is not currently prevailed in the uh, Sybil score? It's going to be a uh, it's complementary to any credit rating score. It's a complementary piece of data. Civil score is a score, uh, which is a single number. Uh, financial asset information, uh, by reading one's bank statements, insurance holdings, mutual fund and capital market holdings, is a lot more detailed, dynamic, live, synchronous, uh, in-time kind of data which obviously will have a lot more value and uh, in terms of making interpretations and understanding whether the person is credit worthy or not. So it will be read together with the civil score for lenders to come to smarter lending decisions. And like I said, it will be far more real time and far more vibrant than a single static score. Thank you so much. I'll come back to you. We would like to remind participants that you may press star 1 to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Devi Shadarwal from IIFL Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just wanted to understand, although you touched upon this in your uh, opening remarks, uh, the yield for the mutual fund business uh, it has kind of come off by 1% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Now, I understand that the increase in the AUM yields are likely to come off. But uh, isn't there any benefit of higher equity component in the AUM? I thought uh, higher equity share should have led to either a flattish kind of a yield. Okay, uh, so let me take that question. So uh, you are right, there is an increase in the equity component of the mix. So I would split it into three parts. Uh, you know, uh, there are three components of what the yield is dependent on. One is the telescopic pricing, which is, has a direct relationship with the growth in the AUM. Second is the mix part of it, uh, which, is, uh, which is what you alluded to in terms of equity. And third is the price negotiation. So if you actually look at it from a volume perspective, there has been a huge growth in the assets, right? So if you look at it from a volume perspective, the growth in assets itself will have a depletion in the yield. But it would have been higher if not for the favorable asset mix. So the 70% thumb rule that we spoke about historically is after considering all the three components. Hence, the, uh, the, uh, if you see the last quarter, uh, quarter on quarter, the asset growth was around 3.3, 3.4%. And the growth in AUM fees was also tracking that it was around 2.4%. 
So there is not an unnatural depletion in yields that we have seen uh, because of the AUMP. The, the drop in revenue is more attributable to the fall in the transaction revenue that was attributable to the COVID-related uh, you know, localized lockdowns in the last quarter. Okay, understood. And uh, secondly, on your non-mutual fund business, if you can give us certain more clarity uh, among the three businesses in terms of uh, their revenue contribution and the margin profiles. Sure. So, uh, as, as we mentioned, the non-mutual fund uh, includes the AAF, uh, the CAMSPAY, which is the ACH access the digital, uh, and it includes the, uh, the repository, which is the insurance business, and there is some amount of our KRA and uh, software business. In terms of uh, contribution, uh, you know, the will be around 25% contribution from our AAF, uh, CAMSPAY, insurance, and the software come KRA business. That's generally the split that we see in the revenue contribution. In terms of margin profile, uh, AAF business, uh, margin profile is uh, similar to our MF. It's a similar platform-based revenue that we uh, bill our uh, AAF customers. So margin profile is broadly similar to that of MF. Uh, um, CAMS Pay is a higher margin business. Uh, you know, it's, it's a decent margin business, not high as MF. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's also seeing some pricing pressures given the competition. But it's a decent margin business. It's although not as high as MF. Uh, repository, there is a challenge in terms of margin. As you know, there's an investment phase. Uh, there is a necessity for the volumes to pick up for us to see uh, higher margins on the repository. Uh, the outsourcing part of it is a low, low margin business. And uh, so that kind of summarizes the margin uh, profile for the non-MF business. Uh, the one other thing I left out was the software business. Software was uh, software is more of a capital business, but we do some work uh, for the mutual funds uh, on APIs, on websites, etc. So that margin profile is similar to uh, similar to a high margin software business. So this is the summary. Okay, sir. And uh, so, uh, frankly, in migration. Uh, would there be any one-time cost uh, that we will be incurring or have incurred? Uh, so the transition is happening for the, as you, as you probably would have read, it's happening for the last uh, more than a year. So uh, what we do is as and when the seek team or other costs that we incur, we kind of uh, charge it to the p and as and when it is incurred. And uh, so there is no special one-time transition cost that we foresee. Uh, uh, apart from obviously the rebadging cost and the employees coming on board uh, would, would happen in the Q2, but that's that's part of the revenue that's coming on board also. So one-time transition cost, exceptional cost, we don't expect to see in the coming quarters. Understood. And our last one, uh, this unified platform that uh, SEBI kind of came up with, uh, if you could throw some more clarity on that and whether we would be required to put any capex for this, uh, or will this include any regular OPEX? And will there be any contribution from mutual funds or would there be any revenue stream from this platform for us? Yeah, sure. So uh, this platform which was announced, uh, both the press and then you would have seen a circular come out from the regulator. Uh, emanate from a committee which was set up for the ease of doing business. Like I said, uh, because the two registrars now almost manage all the 40 plus mutual funds in the back offices. The emerging idea was to unify all service requests for an investor who may have invested in one or two, and you know there are investors who may have invested in 10 or more funds. To do, make a single request, let's say for transmission of units, or for change of bank request, or any of these things, and then gradually expanding to other kinds of transactions also. Uh, the the RTAs have been called upon to build this platform, so we are building it. Uh, right now, this is being built by the two RTAs at largely our own cost, and that's um, the, philosoph the philosophical position that the industry decided to take, and we are backing it completely. Uh, revenue opportunities will emerge. I think it's too early for me to talk about revenue opportunities, but will emerge from this. But exactly what will they be, and will it be based on transactions, etc., will emerge in the future. But think of it as a great utility, so it will benefit the overall market. I think that's a big positive. It will benefit investors, ease out their lives, and therefore, as a derivative benefit, 
the participation in mutual funds and investment and exit etc will become far easier as you make that you know all markets become more attractive secondly from a overall brand salience perspective uh, it is a creative for us and those are the two big advantages one at the industry level one at the cans brand level that we are seeking to get out of this and then over a period of time i, I think everything else will follow perfect sir thank you so much thank you participants to ask a question you may press star and one now the next question is from the line of pk sarkar an individual investor please go ahead uh first of all uh, congratulations on the wonderful results um my question is uh, regarding uh, profitability of the different uh, business segments of cans uh, with particular uh, reference to the franklin templeton business and going forward are deals like franklin templeton going to be strategic for the company okay if i if i just uh, understand your question so your question is on the profitability profile of franklin templeton and the part it will play in camps going forward so from a uh, franklin and templeton the, sorry and a comparison with uh, the profitability of other segments so uh, we generally do not provide specific customer wise profitability or segment wise profitability but i will give you a uh, uh, broad guidance on this so franklin uh, the migration has is happening as we speak and uh, you know we are now live on july so what we expect over the course of the year is that uh, we will uh, we will kind of have a, a positive ebitda or a break even ebitda in the course of the year so initially there will be this uh, you know settling down and transition and additional cost that we will incur and the rebadging cost so what we expect over a period of uh, the year is that we will break even or have a small small, small ebitda positive uh, uh, situation in terms of comparison with the mutual fund i think uh, as i said we don't give segment wise comparison but uh, franklin is a very strategic uh, strategic uh, uh, acquisition for us in terms of customer because as you know that you know arun was mentioning earlier this is probably the largest transition that's happened in the rta space in the recent past and probably ever uh, and this kind of increases the entire series because as you recollect franklin was the only in house rta for all the mutual funds in india and the fact that uh, you know camps has been chosen for this transition and franklin is now a camps customer you know speaks volumes about us salians as an rta so from a strategic perspective i think it's very very important for us that this is successful and we are on the right track for that thank you thank you Reminder to the participants: Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star and one at this time. The next question is from the line of Nikhil Nagarwal from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Mr. Nagarwal, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah, so I wanted to understand like what are your charges? Like how do you charge? Do you charge on 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 the monthly AUM or on the monthly average and access and the management? And uh, secondly, what what exactly is your mode? Like tomorrow, if some other registrar comes up, can can first of all the transition is I understand that it's difficult to happen, but is that can that be possible in the near future? Thank you. okay i will answer the first part of it on charging and request anuj to pitch in on the second question on the modes so from a charging perspective i see our uh, revenue there is two component to it on the mf revenue one is the asset based uh, revenue and it's a non asset based revenue the asset based revenue is what you mentioned uh, we charge on the average aum at the end of the month based on our specific bips uh, the bips rate is as decided with individual customer uh, when we enter into bilateral discussions with them and this is depending on the asset class whether it's equity debt liquid or others and uh, the rates are as defined in the contract and we charge or we invoice them on a monthly basis based on the average asset center management for that particular period so this constitutes uh, the major part of the uh, mf revenue the remaining part of uh, the mf revenue which is the non asset based revenue has got four five components but the major part of it is the transaction based revenue we bill for the paper based transactions 
which happen through our front offices. Uh, there is the uh, activity of receiving the uh, papers, scanning it, entering into the system, digitizing it, etc. So there is some compensation that we build for these activities for paper-based transactions. And then we run some agent services like call centers for our customers and we build them for that. And then there is the out-of-pocket expenses that we incur in the course of our, uh, you know, discharging our duties as RTA. We incur various expenses on behalf of customers uh, and contractually we get it reimbursed from them. So this is also part of the non-asset non based revenue and MF. So this is the way the billing happens or the revenue is recognized for the mutual fund space. On the modes and uh, you know on the possibility of uh, you know this uh, customers migrating from RTA to another, I think that has been covered but I would let probably Anuj uh, uh, pitch in on that. This is just so that you understand uh, the the RTA operations are very deeply intermeshed with that of the mutual fund. Uh, this is not just uh, providing bodies of people to execute processes, but you know that the entire platform on which the work gets done, the core ERP kind of platform, transaction origination platforms. Uh, the industry data bureau, the APIs, web services, the entire CRM platform, all of that is supplied by the RTA and that's a big chunk of value that the consumer gets. Similarly, all the interlinkages with the one lakh sellers, the many banks, uh, the exchanges, depositories, courier companies, payment aggregators, fund accountants, all of that is built by us as the RTA and the client just comes and plugs into it. And then all the deep nuanced knowledge of process, process design, risk management, compliance, reporting, and then operational day-to-day -day delivery of the hundreds of items that get performed on the liability side operations work, all of that is done by the RTA. It's a deeply knowledge-driven, knowledge-intensive work it is not like any outsourcing that you commonly see in the markets even done by big industry leaders either indian or global so if somebody wants to move away from one rta to another all of this has to be ripped away and all of it has to be created from a platform electronic infrastructure physical infrastructure process and design perspective and while none of that is impossible it's a very complex, long drawn task. And for a mature relationship to move from place A to place B, it could easily be a one to one and a half year journey with a lot of challenges and deep commitment of people and, uh, you know, uh, capital and costs, all of this to happen. <clears throat> I think that is the single largest moat that is there in the industry. There are, of course, several others, but just to answer your question. That I think is the largest bit of enduring value, which is not easy for any new uh, person or even an incumbent to copy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We would like to remind participants that you may press star 1 to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Prayesh Jain from Otila Oswal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. So just uh, from a margin perspective, is it fair to say that we have reported peak margins in Q1 and margins will decline from here on, uh, given that, you know, the share of uh, transaction-based revenues will, in, will inch up uh, from Q2 onwards with lockdown opening up. Uh, secondly, uh, FP will start getting integrated where the costs will, be, will come in and the margins will only decline from here on. Uh, what would be your sense there? So, Prayesh, as you know, uh, we would not like to give any uh, forward-looking guidance, but, uh, you know, and this also depends on how the assets grow in terms of the um, non-MF business growth as well as the mixed growth. So, there are various complex factors that play a part in this, but all things remaining same, um, you know, obviously the uh, the lesser yielding, uh, profit yielding component of the revenue is the transaction revenue. So uh, from that perspective, your conclusion is right. As in the more the transaction revenue as such is not very profit accretive for us. Okay. Um, 
The next question is from the line of Madhu Gupta from Quantum Asset Management Company. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, congratulations for a good set of numbers. Uh, basically, my question is regarding, uh, uh, I, mean, I, I just needed a clarification that uh, CAMS uh, has two additional revenue drivers. One is that it has a monopoly over EMC data and that is utilized to provide analytic services for a fee, which I believe is what is being offered under CAMS pay. And the second revenue driver is that uh, also MC has outsourced maintenance of distribution database to CAMS, and for which CAMS receives fees from MC as well as distributors and EMC. Is that right? I mean, uh, is, is, I mean, I just required a, a clarification that these are the two additional drivers, revenue drivers for CAMS as compared to the peers. Uh, so uh, let me just clarify that as principles. AMCs continue to own their data and AMFI owns AMFI's data and CAMS does not own any of that. Nor do we have any arrangement to monetize that in any form or shape. So that's point number one. Okay. With AMFI, we have this arrangement to service distributors, manage the ARN issuance and renewal process and there are lots of related processes to that, but that's the part that we manage for Amphi from a process execution and platform perspective. We, we don't do anything with Amphi's data, that's Amphi's data. We sell a service and we get some revenue for that, but that's not very large, that's a small piece of revenue. As far as the AMCs are concerned, uh, there is only one format, and I would not like to call it analytics, it's most like business insights called MF Dex or the MF Data Explorer which is a U versus industry contrast for Indian mutual funds because everyone, both CAM service funds and non-CAM service funds, pour in data. And we serve it back to them from a U versus industry comparison across key metrics of FIP registration, net sales, etc. Uh, for distributors, clusters of distributors, geographical uh, territory basis. Uh, but again, that's a small piece of revenue. We do it mostly as an industry data bureau service, consolidating all of the data in one place and then giving back to the industry in meaningful chunks of uh, business insights. So that's all we do. The ownership of data continues to remain with the principal and we do not infringe that line ever. The fee earned is a very small amount from both these services. Yes, th those are small amounts. Okay, yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks. Thank you. The last question is from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from Kota. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, good morning, sir. Just uh, two questions from my side. One is uh, on this AIS business, could you mention, you know, what sort of uh, proportion of revenues or yields you are getting on the business and, you know, what is the outlook on that business? Uh, and the second is, uh, you know, from the sanctions acquisition perspective, what is the sort of uh, in a back office or front office employees you have kind of planned to add or already added and what is the you know kind of uh, cost increase that you and such for the uh, you know for, for, for this particular business what is the sort of cost increase to you and such for the overall business okay uh, uh so the first question on af uh, so as i was mentioning uh you know the non-mf business af will uh, will have an approximately 25 percent share of the non-mf business and non-mf business is uh, around 10 percent of the overall revenue so you can do the math uh, in terms of growth i think anuj was mentioning about it in the earlier slides too so this is a uh, this is a sweet spot this is a platform based service that we render uh, to our af clients in terms of rta services so this is the market size is not comparable to the MF. It's restricted in terms of size and also in terms of people who will want to outsource this. And given in a lot of AAFs, the number of investors would not justify an outsourcing for their operations, RTA operations. Having said that, you know, this is a, we are introducing some new products in this line, uh, something about a digital onboarding for PMS and AAF customers, which is seeing a lot of traction in the first few months that we have launched it. This is especially relevant in the pandemic uh, period where you know people are able to digitally onboard their entire uh, investors and uh, including integration with uh, you know they're signing your agreements getting the forms filled integrating with your dp etc so that product is seeing some traction 
So, uh, so we are very positive on the scope uh, in terms of the AI of business. Uh, it has grown at a fair clip over the last few years, and we expect that that will sustain. As I said, the only limiting factor for this would be the overall market size not being as high as a and MF or other businesses. Uh, but for that, I think within that small base, I think we we will keep growing at a healthy pace in the next few years. Uh, sure. um, and on the expense side for the Franklin. Uh... So Franklin, uh, the arrangement with Franklin is clear. Uh, we rebadge or take over their employees of the RTA services, and uh, they have all come on board as a part of Camp's payroll. And uh, so, uh, as I was saying, the the what we expect is we have onboarded the employees, and the revenues also started coming to Camp's. Uh, we expect that uh, you know over the period of year these things uh, will settle down, uh, but we don't expect a positive EBITDA to emerge uh, in the next uh, quarter or two. Post that, we will see positive EBITDA. So the revenue and the cost should sort of be balanced over the next few quarters. The employees that we are taking over. Sure. So just to follow up, uh, what will be your AI of uh, AUM as on it? AI for PMS AUM. Uh, just give me one second. Four sure. percent. About two lakh crores. Yeah, it was about two lakh crores. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Nishan from Kotak Institutional Equities for closing comments. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We thank the management for providing us an opportunity to 